Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to Interia, to the very last session. This is uh, Juan Carlos and Wasim, your chair. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Hi, Wasim. Hello. Welcome, everyone. So we're going to start by uh, the usual. Uh, please uh, join the queue before participating to make it uh, easier for everyone. And be kind to mute your mic on the, unless you are, you are speaking. Preferably, turn off um, your video. Uh, if you're presenting, you want to turn on your video, that's fine. Uh, if you have questions or uh, any doubts about how to operate meter code, you have the links there on the screen. The node well, this is a regular ITF meeting, so please uh, be aware of the, the rules. Uh, by participating, you agree to follow the process and policies. If you're aware of any patent uh, that covers uh, any contribution or something that has been said here, please disclose it. Um, and then as a participant, uh, you are acknowledging that um, this uh, written audio and video records may be used and may be made public. Uh, we will uh, for sure uh, make sure that you respect other participants. And if you have any questions, you have all the links there to the different PCPs and uh, procedures. As a reminder, uh, we're going to be taking minutes. The meeting is recorded. Your presence is being logged. The usual blue sheets when you log into the data tracker. We're going to ask, please, uh, to help us uh, with the minutes uh, by clicking on the, or the code EMD uh, in Miteco or on the link uh, that is uh, in the slides so that we can keep track of the what it's been said at the meeting. And uh, again, bear in mind that recordings and minutes will be made, publics, made, made, made public and uh, subject to discovering the event of uh, litigation. So the agenda, we have quite a heavy agenda. We are going to start by giving you an update on the working group status. Uh, then myself, I'm going to provide an update of the Marina's buff that we uh, had on, on Wednesday. Uh, followed by that, uh, Chatura will uh, talk about the tactile internet. Then we have functional addressing uh, from Torlos. Then problems and requirements of satellite constellation for internet. Lin Han, challenging scenarios and problems in internet addressing from Yihao Jia, uh, followed by gap analysis and in internet addressing from him as well, requirements and scenarios for industry internet addressing, Kiran, and uh, finally, uh, transmission of IP packets over overlay multi link network, the only interfaces by Fred. Is there any bashing or questions about the agenda? Eric. One comment we need to get a minute taker on this. Is there any volunteer or did I miss somebody that already volunteered for doing it? Can someone help us uh, with, with the minutes? Uh, of course, we're going to be also taking minutes, but uh, if, can we have someone uh, describing? It can be done after by listening to the recording, of course, but it's way better if somebody not record everything, but only the questions and the answers. Uh, in the commit, it is the um, top icon with the square and the pen on it. Uh, does it need to be accurate? We might try because everyone can fix it later. But we need to get one. Do we have any volunteer? Please. Indeed, please. <laughs> Basically, I'm afraid that we cannot start without this. And if you have never done this, go on, Wasim. Please, if someone can do that, 
would be much appreciated. So Luigi says that he can do it later, later based on the on the recording. Uh, uh, do you mean uh, helping us with the notes? If so, um, it doesn't have to be all the time you, but uh, it would be appreciated if you can help us uh, with part of it. Luigi? Yes, I just wanted to say I can help with minutes. I mean, uh, I usually like to do it uh, listening to the recordings. If that helps, I can do it. Perfect. Thank okay. you very much. That's That's appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Luigi. Uh, you're most welcome. Let's start. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So, indeed, uh, let's move on. Um, quick status update uh, for the generic UDP encapsulation. This is draft IETF interior GUI 09 uh, that was submitted to ISG. Uh, and it's been uh, there for quite a while, close to a year. So uh, I guess uh, this, if, if there's no interest in, in advancing this document, it will just uh, die uh, soon. I don't know, uh, Eric, do, do you want to say something about it? Yeah, I mean, it's the latest version is mostly two years ago. I submitted uh, after my AD review comments on the mailing list about a year ago in October it will be one year. My plan is that and the authors have not here either. Uh, so in October twenty twenty one I will declare this document dead. Uh, meaning it doesn't progress. It's no more part of the working group. Uh, work can continue later of course, right? But it will need to restart from the working group adoption. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that uh, clarification, Eric. Okay, so um, then I'm going to uh, give you a quick update of the Madinas buff. Um, as a reminder, Madinas is a MAC address uh, randomization and, and the effect on network address services. It was a buff uh, held first at IETF 109 and then followed by a side meeting at IETF 110. So that was a non forming, uh, non working group forming uh, buff. And uh, for this IETF uh, 111, we had a buff uh, working group forming where we discussed more in detail uh, the charter. In this case, the idea uh, is for the group to um, uh, work on um, the, the problem statement, the use cases, and the effects of MAC address randomization on different network services with the idea that uh, the group will uh, only work on informational documents uh, in the beginning, but also, and very importantly, will help with liaison uh, with other SDOs and working groups on this topic. So uh, to give an idea of the, the result uh, of the group, uh, there was a very interesting support uh, about uh, the problem statement that uh, people were interested in the topic and uh, willing to uh, contribute. So right now we are finalizing the, the charter, drafting the charter. And if you are interested in the topic, I invite you to join the, the mailing list. Uh, you have the link there. But uh, that's pretty much uh, the update for Madinas. Uh, Eric? Yeah, and just to be clear on the process, as many of us know, uh, the working group is not yet formally created. I personally have good feeling about it after the buff and the, the energy which is behind and the draft charter. It will be decided next week by the IAB and the IAC whether this working group may proceed by the chattering. Uh, but I'm quite confident it will be. So stay tuned on this one. And of course, collaborate on the chatter revision at some point of time when we'll be discussing with the community. Great. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, with that, we are going to move to uh, the next presentation. So we have uh, Chatura, please, uh, if you want to uh, share your slides.
it's your time. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, you prefer me do this uh, to share the slides, I believe. Um, yes. Um, so I'm giving you access now. Okay. So uh, one second. Sorry. Um, Um, sorry, for some reason it says no slides available. Um, okay, do you want to share your screen then? Let's see. Uh, it should be okay, yes. One second, sorry, sorry about this. Um, okay. It says that screen sharing thing started. Okay, please let me know when you can see the screen. Yes, we can see it. Right, um, is this set up okay? I'm not um, actually, um, is this okay? So, yep. right. Okay, uh, sorry about that guys. Uh, um, I'm uh, Chatra Sarakchandra. And I'm going to present a, uh, a draft that we've recently submitted on requirements for tactile internet, um, which I have uh, co-authored with Mortesa, which I believe also uh, uh, online, and also Mona. Um, this is uh, sort of the uh, table of content. I would not go too much into detail because this is the first time I'm presenting this as also, it's the first time presenting in ITF as well. So the, all of the content here is, is, is new. Um, the main goal of this draft uh, is to present uh, tactile internet or TI use cases. Uh, and then potential requirements that can be addressed within IETF or IITF groups. Uh, this is purely an informational draft that is meant to address discussions in this area. So what is tactile internet? Tactile internet is a new ICT paradigm which can provide uh, um, ultra low latency, uh, ultra reliability and real time communications. Uh, services to emerging applications such as teleoperation, immersive VR, and haptic communication, which, which involves closed loop, human in the loop interactions. These applications require multi-sensory, multimodal communication, where information related to audio, video, as well as touch are communicated in real time. Although there are various existing related efforts uh, in standards to address some of the requirements, uh, for example, uh, the work in 5G URLC in 3GPP, a more holistic uh, 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 approach could be taken to support all TI requirements for efficiently supporting uh, TI applications. Um, there is also a working group on tactile internet uh, in IEEE 1918.1, which looks at aspects such as applications, architecture, and uh, haptic encoding. Um, TI applications in, often involves bidirectional communication, uh, as can be uh, seen in the figure, which shows a teleoperation system. 
in one side you you can see a human operator which controls a robot in remote tech, uh, task environment uh, this is done by providing control input by the human operator while receiving various feedback related to the environment in the remote task environment there are various uh, end devices or terminals or tactile devices such as sensors and actuators and either side of the uh, both side of the uh, the figure so usually you know you could you can imagine so these sensors are often uh, used for capturing those multimodal information uh, while actuators are uh, used for executing the instructions for example uh, provided by the human operator the tactile internet networking infrastructure enables the transmission of information generated by uh, by those devices in both sides and then and, and transmit them to, to bi-directionally. Um, so let's look at some use cases. Remote operations, automation, smart factory are key industry use cases that are enabled by TI. For example, uh, TI enables remote repairing and maintenance of machines. This could be in high risk scenarios where it might be too dangerous for persons to go or when it's too uh, not possible uh, for an expert to be uh, physically present at the time. Often such remote operation scenarios require multimodal, that is, for example, audio, video, haptic feedback for performing complex uh, uh, task remotely. Healthcare is also quite an attractive uh, use case for uh, TI, uh, which includes telesurgery, telediagnosis, telerehabilitation, telementoring. For example, um, telesurgery allows specialist surgeons to perform operations remotely. Um, even surgical robots that uh, uh, are being used today, uh, although the operators are uh, operated locally, performs highly precise operations while minimizing the invasiveness of, of the operation being performed. Um, uh, tactile internet, uh, sorry, tactile communication is very important here uh, also, um, as tactile feedback is crucial uh, when performing highly precise operations, as also mentioned in the previous use case. Um, based on an article published uh, in, uh, I believe, 2019, uh, a surgeon has performed a remote operation using 5G technology on an animal from 30 miles away. And this is considered a world first as well. Entertainment, well, one might argue that is an obvious scenario where haptic feedback uh, and communication can be incorporated. For example, by providing haptic feedback for uh, VR gaming, we have tourism, VR art uh, applications or even existing explorations for um, elevating the user experience uh, as of, the, of these applications. However, in collaborative VR applications, uh, added haptic feedback will improve uh, the user experience to that of or close to, uh, to the real physical interactions. Um, haptic enabled uh, TI applications can improve uh, experiences of both uh, learners and teachers in, in training scenarios, training applications, uh, and not only enables users to train remotely. Um, Audio, again here as well, audio, uh, video, or audio, visual, tactile enabled learning experiences provide learning environments that are closest, closer to face-to-face uh, -face environments. And collaborative learning, uh, uh, learning applications can also be benefited, such as um, military, military applications or sports applications, uh, where, where it requires learners to solve problems in a collaborative manner where multisensory interactions are key. Now, um, we're gonna look at some of the requirements. Um, so 
there has not been a media type for haptics until recent adoption of haptics as a media type in MPEG systems file for format subgroup in ISO or BMFF. So like audio, video, haptics also are related to a separate sensory system and can benefit or even better suited uh, to have a separate media type. Adopting haptics as a top level media type in IETF is an important step towards further development of haptic communication. In fact, uh, 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 there is a specific uh, draft um, uh, discussing this speci specific fact uh, in, uh, in this patchworking group, which is uh, referenced here. Um, So ultra low latency is, is, is quite an important uh, requirement uh, for tactile internet applications because real time uh, haptic interactions demand for one millisecond ultra low latency as can be seen on the example provided in the figure. And we extracted this figure from a, a ITU uh, technical report on tactile internet. Timely delivery of messages is crucial for tactile internet applications such as remote uh, maintenance in industry and telesurgery um, in healthcare. Like low latency, ultra high reliability is a crucial requirement uh, uh, for tactile internet applications as well. Uh, as you can imagine, hindering the reliability of communication, for example, in open heart surgery, uh, telesurgery, um, yeah, applications can have very undesirable uh, consequences. All multimodal systems um, belonging to the same application, uh, uh, sorry, all multimodal streams belong to the same application, uh, uh, must be uh, paid back to the user in a synchronous manner. Otherwise, it's, this can lead to reduced quality of experience and issues such as uh, cyber sickness. Multimodal, for example, audio, video, haptic streams of the same application may be distributed even among uh, uh, multiple tactile or uh, terminal devices. For example, you know, these days you, uh, you own users on more than one device often are surrounded by multiple devices and these are applications may as well use those devices for providing uh, experiences and in such scenarios those streams may be distributed among those devices due to various network conditions and lack of support or assistance for synchronizations these streams may arrive at corresponding devices out of synchronization and leave the applications to deal with it and can also lead to delayed playback or, or interruptions even. Therefore, it is important to provide a further support or assistance for synchronization for both single and multi-destination scenarios or single or multi-user, scenario, uh, multi-device scenarios. For satisfying stringent requirements of uh, tactile internet applications, such as ultra low latency, treated networks as a black box might not be sufficient. Adapting uh, application behavior using coarse grained uh, measurements of the network resources may or not also be enough. But maybe a more collaborative approach could, uh, where an app applications and networks can better express their requirements and constraints may be required. In such scenarios, um, networks, networks may, uh, may manage their resources to satisfy application requirements and applications may adapt themselves to network constraints, uh, of course, when possible, um, at least better than today. Um, it is also important to have mechanisms for coordinating communication. Uh, such coordination mechanisms may al allow various networks and network conditions to be intelligently handled. For example, there might be scenarios where, um, uh, data, uh, where data packet scheduling across uh, multiple terminals or access networks are required, especially in, the, in scenarios 
uh, such as multi-device scenarios where you might have uh, multiple devices and those devices connected through different access networks. Um, instability of underlying network conditions of one stream therefore may affect the whole multimodal user experience. TI, uh, uh, tactile internet uh, applications uh, can be highly dynamic. For example, in a multi, in multi-user scenario, especially uh, when user profiles, user dynamic relations and interactions are present, uh, and multimodal information corresponds to each individual user, especially related to the user perception, can be distinct. Um, for example, a VR environment where multi-users act on the same environment. Uh, perceptions like individual viewpoint, uh, uh, the operations performed, tasks being performed, type of tools may be used, type of objects uh, that uh, these using interact with. with. The information uh, corresponding to each individual user may differ and throughout the whole execution uh, of the application as well. And therefore, multimodal da data that's been transferred uh, using separate streams uh, to, uh, to users may be personalized accordingly. Um, if you had a chance to uh, read the draft, you might have noticed, uh, made a couple of uh, just uh, changes, well, one change. Uh, we've changed the term from service requirements to application requirements to sort of uh, better reflect what we present uh, in the uh, here and to avoid ambiguity and confusions as well. Um, and that's pretty much it for, uh, for this presentation. And questions, comments, suggestions are very welcome. And also, uh, if you, you know, if there are any suggestions or other suitable group that might be interested in the draft, uh, they're highly welcome as well. We've uh, had this discussion also on mailing list. We received a number of suggestions and thank you for those as well. And we will take them into consideration. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so we have people in the queue. So Colin. Um, okay, so, so I, 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 was, I sort of put my question out back when I saw the, the latency requirement about one millisecond. And I mean, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to why it's that low when humans are in the loop, because that, I think there's been a few other people too that that seemed probably faster than was needed for anything that involved human interaction, which presumably since this, this is tactile, we're all talking about a human being in the loop at some point. And I get the point for the synchronization and the low latency. I'm just trying to push on how low a latency we do we need on one side of the question. And then on the other side of the question, I mean, I, you know, if we do need those types of latency, is, is internet technology really appropriate for that? Like even if we're running in a LAN, I don't think that we can reliably deliver one millisecond. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious what your thoughts are in, in both the do we really need that low? And is this technology that we're talking about at ITF even remotely appropriate for that? Thanks. Thank you, Colin. Um, with regards to the mul uh, one millisecond requirement, um, my understanding is that it is it, it, it depends on the type of application, for example. Um, if it That's why it's specifically worded as interactions, maybe, where it, it, it is, uh, you know, it, it has to be sort of an online interaction. If you are, I guess, you know, just transferring that over, you know, uh, you know, just the network over, it's, it's less of a, if it's a less of interaction, I guess, uh, then it will be, it will be, you know, it won't be that much of a requirement, but it is a known sort of understood, well understood uh, uh, sort of a, a requirement at, at, at this moment in time. Um, to answer your second question, uh, this is exactly you know why why kind of uh, we wanted to bring it up to sort of ask the question whether you know how or whether and if uh, can the internet um, sort of um, uh, deliver on this prom promise or uh, on these requirements um, uh, at this point moment in time. I don't think all the 
sort of um, even solution, not even you know, less of solution, but even the problems are clear. But but there's some of the requirements we try to sort of list. But yeah, so this is still up for discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stuart. Hello. Um, my question about this presentation is uh, it's, it's not a surprise to anybody at the IETF that we would like a network that is high throughput and low latency and reliable. Uh, I don't think anybody would fall off their chair and think that was a, an amazing insight they'd never heard of before. Uh, in fact, I would say for 40 years since the internet was created, it, the goal has always been to make it a reliable, high throughput, low latency network to the, to the best of our ability with the technology we know. Uh, so the fact that we want this is not a surprise. Is there any proposal for how to do this? Is this talking about uh, FQCODL, PI, L4S, something else? Uh, what is the proposal for how we would get from where we are today to something better? Thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, you, you are you are right. Um, I mean, uh, yes. So always we we try to as you know uh, we've been try to to reduce the latencies and provide higher bandwidth and etc. Um, uh, I so you know exactly to as to a a proposal as to how to sort of solve this. I do not particularly have uh, fully solved the whole, you know, uh, problem to, to meet all requirements. Um, I do not uh, have uh, an exact answer, uh, but I believe maybe, you know, addressing some of the requirements in, in, in different areas, uh, such as your LLC and uh, various other areas, I think eventually that's 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 where we are moving towards uh, uh, ultimately. I think also on top of these um, uh, low latency and high reliability uh, requirements, there's also this added uh, modality of communication there as well, which is haptic communication. I guess the question for the network community is that do we need uh, or do we need to handle do those traffic uh, uh, differently to the other ones as well? As, as I mentioned, uh, there's already a discussion on, um, you know, uh, having haptics as a top-level media type as well. So, so that's sort of other aspects that brings uh, these applications into the sort of uh, picture. Uh, okay, so my suggestion, if you want to move this work forwards, is propose ways to solve these problems, because I think the existence of the problems themselves is already known. The question is what to do about it. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, uh, Jordas. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So going back to Fluffy's maybe rhetorical question, what we even want to have for these type of stringent services, I think that um, there is no reason why IP networking couldn't be as good in any of these quality parameters as any other packet networking technology. And yet, if we look at the past 20 years, then I think it would be fair to say that for anything that provides better than best effort, um, IEEE, uh, with uh, efforts ending up in TSN have really eaten our lunch and uh, you know we're struggling to, with uh, for a comeback with TSN and maybe there is a more generic question of how the community could be more inviting to you know application use cases industries that are having more stringent uh, requirements like this one upcoming. All right, thank you very much. So if there are no further questions, then I guess we can move to the next presentation, which is 
Cordless. Thank you. Right. If you can um, accept my request for sharing slides. There is yeah, let me revoke this one and grant you. Okay, what do I want to talk about? Ah, this, this looks good. OK, terrible name. Um, you know, we'll pay pizza and so for a better name. Um, ah, it's like not moving. What happens? Yeah. Right. So, right. So, so there have been, you know, recently proposals in Int area and also, you know, outside of Int area in uh, more with research focus about what uh, we can do with addresses, different semantics, and so on. So I started to think about one type of problem space that I think we haven't well explored which is in the title, independent address spaces. And um, I've presented on IoT Ops, so the problem statement might be something to take out of uh, this work and uh, work in maybe an operational group. Um, and, I and there, obviously, the solution proposed uh, um, solves other problem, I think, that are much more shorter term and much more obvious to, to people in a better shape than the existing solutions. But I wanted to focus really on what might be the most um, uh, offensive option that uh, is in here, given how we've kind of said this is not a good thing to do. Um, so let's uh, say the generic issue that I see is that in our network layer protocol IPv6, we've pretty much focused on the one core problem we needed to solve in the 90s, which is the internet, and uh, forgetting a little bit that we need to have a network layer that doesn't only serve these 10% of the IETF uh, deployment uh, uh, iceberg, uh, which is 90% under the waterline since 8799. We're calling this limited domains, and it includes everything from embedded IoT devices over to a lot of other uh, IoT and OT uh, energy sector, manufacturing, oil and gas, transportation, nationwide networks, and obviously not, not to the last service provider networks with MPLS, which all have nothing to do with the internet. And uh, if you look then at what support do we have in IPv6 addressing for these, it's just a terrible you know, um, set of uh, limitations and challenges. I wrote some of them on the left-hand side. Read the document for more, uh, and certainly a lot more to go on on that. So the independent address space is something that you see very often in these type of IoT environments with larger networks, starting with um, you know, simple hierarchically built um, environments like you build a simple machinery out of an Ethernet with attached uh, sensors, actors, uh, controllers, and then you plug them together for a, a larger machinery with another level of um, uh, networking, and then yet another one. And ultimately, these things become assembly lines. And then you look at an overall you know, smart manufacturing network of networks, and you can see that there is a lot of plugging together hierarchically in any other shape or form of networking, differently complex networks, where really the last thing you want to have is having to bother about a single global address space into which you would, according to the end-to-end -end internet principle of IPv6, have to um, address everything uh, in these networks into. So, and uh, the, the one typical example from IPv4, which also is why a lot of these things are still happily built with IPv4 and RFC 1918 address space is exactly such a machinery. 1000x are the uh, fixed addresses assigned to every instance of the product that is being built. In deployment, uh, the gateway, which is an Ethernet switch. If you ever wondered why industrial Ethernet switches have crazy NAT, this is it. Right? You're basically mapping, let's say, with a standard mechanism, the third byte of the address to the orange Ethernet so that uh, multiple of these type of machineries can be uh, um, disambiguated in their address. And then to the green one, another layer with the uh, second byte of the address. Maybe you even go into IPv6 for larger scale. But uh, obviously, this is not part of the standard uh, architecture of IP. It's an afterthought that people got out of RFC 1918. And IPv6 with ULA is actually worse and doesn't even offer any more bits of you know address that you can munch with. It's the same 16-bit that you have free as an IPv4. So. Um, with that being said, let's uh, take a look at a simple example scenario explaining how variable length addresses with the semantic, um, I think, is easy to implement, would be able to solve that. All our addresses are uh, written as simple hexadecimal addresses separated by optional dots just to show um, you know, uh, 
where, where the address is segmented, has no other you know, functional. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> everything is modulo four, so that you know, every structural, so it prefixes, for example, just modulo four, addresses length modulo four, so we don't cut into a single digit. Now, the important part of the address allocation within a particular network is that every node um, gets assigned um, a prefix that is not overlapping with any other node's prefix. And then you just use normal IGP routing. These are all, let's say, like loopback addresses routed so that they're fixed, permanently assigned in a network. We've got a lot of experience in that with service providers, so very easy to do. So now what do we start? So somebody builds a network from a template like an industry standard, like I've seen it. Um, to, uh, you know, uh, and then even, you know, using addresses that people were recommending, uh, which is fine, very simple. These are all just, you know, uh, what is it, uh, eight bit long addresses, so very short. Um, and then somebody else comes along and builds uh, a second network, exactly the same thing. Maybe these two are our machineries. Um, and uh, of course, you know, topology might be different, addresses in this case, you know, even totally overlapping, but whatever the overlap is. So, how do you now interconnect them? And this is basically where um, the proposal comes in. <clears throat> what you're doing is um, one network is interested to connect to the other. In this case, it's the blue network on the left wanting to connect to the network on the right. So it basically uh, asks for two links into the network. Um, and obviously, from the right network, it's being given uh, two address prefixes, one for each of the links. Uh, they're getting configured. And so we basically have in the blue network now two edge routers between two independent address spaces that are overlapping. So are we sending packets? And this is the, the, the core of the forwarding. So um, as you can see in, um, in the first line here, um, 52 on the left-hand side wants to send a packet to <clears throat> 35 on the right-hand side. The address it's sending to is 22135. What that means is within the blue network, the packet is forwarded purely uh, on the uh, destination address prefix 2. Once it arrives at two, the next two um, digits have the first one, two, saying, well, this is a function of um, the rest of the address is telling you which link you're going to send it. So let's say link one is exactly the link um, from RA into network two. Um, so what then happens is RA, the only thing it needs to do is actually this 12-bit lookup, two, two, one. It strips that prefix. It takes address 35, recirculates that into the forwarding table for network two. Um, opposite can happen optionally if desired for the source address. You prepend the prefix to return through RA before you forward the packet into network two, so you have symmetrical traffic uh, forwarding back. And obviously, this scheme can be expanded to arbitrary topologies of networks with independent address spaces. So very simple forwarding. Um, except for the standard prefix um, lookup that we're already doing, we have a strip address and prepend address um, function that we would need at uh, edge routers between two adjacent two networks with independent address bases. Now, if we generalize this to show how this type of very simple um, semantic approach for building functional addresses, let's say an address is a sequence of functions. Functions could either be, you know, a new other semantic, or it could be, as shown here, a node prefix, and then it's followed by a function code and parameters. Function code, we had function code two, which is this, you know, inter-network routing, um, but it's easy to come up with other function codes. Use the control plane like we've learned in MPLS to assign semantics. So let's say function code zero, could just be followed by a parameter that is the transport protocol. And function code zero means, well, punt it up to transport stack, and here is your transport protocol. So we'll eliminate another um, currently special next protocol field in the packet header. Or we're just doing the packet stealing that we're doing with M SRMPLS or SRV6, right? So pretty much the same thing. You're, rem uh, you're removing the prefix, uh, but you're not uh, doing anything more, very much the same um, as. Um, we would do with function two. And then all this SRV6 programming ob uh, obviously would also be very easy to add into the address as new, par uh, as new functions with parameters. And it wouldn't be a fixed 64-bit like we've got in SRV6 now, but it could be you know, no wasted bits if you don't need it. And it could be more than 64-bit if there is a lot of instruction for a particular hop. And then other semantic, obviously, being something to use um, for multicast, CCN, whatever you have. 
So there is a, a lot that could be said about naming and address resolution. So how do you know where you go to? Uh, what's the name of it in the first place? The addresses are to a good extent names already. And there are a lot of uh, uh, network deployments like industrial and others where you don't need another namespace like DNS. But if you want to do it, we have a lot of experience with that as well. There is a very interesting 21 year old uh, enterprise net multi-homing solution from Yakov uh, that I have in the references. So all these uh, naming and everything things, I think we know how to solve. Maybe last, just to see how simple this can become in the forwarding plane. Let's say we actually do ever want to go beyond IPv6 in a backward compatible fashion. We could build a header that is simplified, removing all the stuff we don't need in most of the cases, just got variable length source destination addresses with their length indication. We still need top limit, ECN, new version, obviously, so that it's not uh, you know uh, changing the v6 header as it is. But then all the QS stuff, for example, could go into an extension header. So simplification with more flexible functionality. Uh, many add-on functions we have in extensions header could simply go in the address. Right, so here is the boring summary. Here is the hopefully more entertaining summary for the end um, of the presentation. And I think we really you know, have gone through an evolution of domesticating addressing. And I think we should be ready to take the next step. Right. So this all started with NET and IPv4. Then we went through a lot of experience with 26 IPv4 to V6 transition solutions, most of which we would probably not like and feel it's wild beasts. But some of them actually are better. We have good you know, functional structure used in V6, especially with multicast. We learned a lot and know how to do better with the address processing in MPLS and uh, source routing in SR, MPLS, and SRH. So you know, um, I think with a proposal like this, we would make exactly all these things that we've done in the um, past 10 years, especially um, in, in very you know, ad hoc fashions based on a you know 20 year old or 50 year old long address ipv6 protocol a lot better if we would uh, you know allow us to think experimenting with a new base header and i think that's it thank you very much great thank you very much uh are there any questions luigi Hi, just a quick clarification question. In uh, so, in your uh, schema of the addresses, you have a way to to encode the function of something. Uh, uh, at some point, you made an example where code two identifies a link, which mm -hmm. means uh, that now you have an identifier or an address or something that allows you to identify a link and. In the example, example that you gave is about uh, inter-AS. So do the both ends need to agree on the same link identifier? And does that explode some, somehow the size of the address? No, effectively, this is this is this is just a path identifier, right? So you're basically saying, go to this edge router. That edge router removes its own prefix then looks at what comes afterward, which he has locally defined to be, let's say, you know, the digit two means the next uh, digit is, you know, one out of 16 links into different networks I could go to. And that's just all part of what could be done in the control plane. It doesn't have to be hard coded in any, you know, forwarding spec plane spec. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have Eric in the queue. Yeah, thank you, Torres. Uh, challenging discussion in uh, and interesting. Do you see this applicable to the complete internet or just inside a small domain like an industry? Um, I, I, I never know what quote the internet is. To me, the internet is a uh, best effort only overlay service on top of you know uh, thousands of underlay networks, right? S uh, service providers, enterprises, you know what have you. And uh, I think you know obviously everything needs to start small in underlays, and you know 
we haven't gotten anything new into quote the internet not since 1995 when it commercialized right we didn't get diff surf into it we didn't get uh, multicast into it right the, the we we've been struggling for 15 years with ecn so no i don't see that the internet service as we've defined it now is something we're going to get anything new into but i we do have diff surf we do have multicast in a lot of metropolitan size service provider networks where they're offering it to customers right so so is that internet? Right. And basically, and without any ads, I should have specified it before. So it's basically a single domain. Based on um, your description. No, no, I think this this part, especially if you if you think about what, what what is a single domain, right? So if I build a manufacturing floor, the responsibility for the components inside of it will lie with the vendor of that equipment, right? It's made maybe plugged together by a fabric owner, but the fabric owner or the, the, the manufacturing plant owner plugs together equipment that, you know, which hierarchically has ownership from people who are selling it as a service and so on. So, but it's not your internet interdomain between service provider with BGP. That I think is the last place to start changing something. Okay. Thank you. Interesting anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, I'm um, very interested. However, question following up actually on Eric question. So I am quite surprised to see the variable length header on your slide. After all these discussions we have in every ATF about, oh my God, IPv6 extension headers are so hard because they're variable length and we don't know how to process them. So what do you think about that? conflict yeah exactly so i was been uh, trying to strip down the complexity in the forwarding plane um because you know going through a chain of extension headers and i said through six men which was very enlightening right i don't want to have this so i'm trying to figure out how we can make it as simple as possible um and i think we could learn a lot from mpls i think this proposal does that because if you look at it you know, you see exactly the forwarding steps, right? The forwarding step was just longest match prefix lookup, then one rewrite, um, then recirculation again for this function, right? If you take the other function, which is steering through the network, it would be equally or cheaper than, let's say, SRH header processing, right? Equal to, I think, MPLS forwarding. Okay, we need prefix lookup instead of fixed 20-bit uh, um, address lookups, right? But yeah, I think, you know, bring it on, right? Let's let's have the battle of comparison of the actual forwarding plane uh, processing complexity. That's, I think, a good topic. And, you know, we did two years ago, we were talking about that uh, as well in terms of let's understand more what forwarding planes can do these days. Um, in the MPLS design team, there are a lot of people standing up telling us we can do more now. Let's explore that. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? All right, so thanks again. So we are now moving to Lynn. Hi. Uh, should Hello. I see him? or yeah you can you can click on on preloaded slides or share screen as you prefer okay we are granting you access now Yeah, we can see your screen. Can you see it? You can go ahead. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, my presentation uh, is about problems and the requirements of satellite constellation for internet. And uh, this is uh, uh, only uh, informational uh, draft since there's no uh, uh, dedicated uh, research group or working group for uh, satellite. And so we bring this to uh, internet area 
uh, for uh, presentation. First, uh, background and uh, uh, motivation. So everyone knows that satellite network is becoming uh, as a hot topic, uh, even for 5G or 6G. And uh, Starlink has provided a beta service, uh, which uh, proves that uh, it has some uh, competitive uh, quality over traditional ISP. And uh, now the Starlink has launched about uh, 1,500 satellites and uh, over 10,000 subscribers. And uh, Elon Musk predicted we will reach uh, uh, 500,000 and uh, quickly. Uh, but the deployment of the service of uh, satellite uh, starting as uh, uh, satellite networking is pre uh, pretty preliminary. Uh, this is uh, information from the Reddit because there are a lot of uh, technical uh, uh, discussing in that uh, group. So uh, we can predict uh, what is the kind of uh, technology the uh, Starlink is using. And also this can be a uh, uh, predict from the uh, service uh, Starlink has provided. It only can provide service in very limited area. And also the quality is not good. It, it needs a long uh, provisioning. Uh, so uh, besides Starlink, more countries and more uh, companies plan to launch LU and VLU. So uh, we will see that what is the kind of Probably in current starting uh, current uh, uh, satellite motivation uh, satellite network. So motivations. So this uh, draft just to analyze the issues and uh, try to uh, draw attention from the com community and uh, probably we will drive better solution in the future. Uh, right now. Uh, the an analysis will just give the uh, 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 estimation uh, from the orbit coverage and the communication time from uh, for the uh, ground station to satellite and between satellites. Then uh, analyze the uh, feasible uh, operation model uh, for start uh, for satellite uh, constellation. Uh, finally, we will list the problems we we think it should be resolved. And uh, as an IETF draft, we only focus on, on the um, uh, layer two and above. Uh, for example, mobility, routing, and switching technology. We don't uh, touch the uh, uh, radio or spectrum or those kind of la uh, physical layer uh, issues. First, the, the satellite orbit elements and the position. This is a general um, logic of uh, astronomy. And uh, uh, they, they have many parameters, uh, but fortunately for the uh, LU and the uh, VLEO, the orbit is very close to a circular. So we, we only use the two uh, parameters. One is the inclination, another is the, the longitude of the ascending nodes, which will describe what is the, 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 in, uh, the, the angle of this orbit turn in this direction. Also, third one is the altitude, of course, because it's a circular orbit. We don't use this, which is related to the athlete's orbit and also, also this. So the real-time position of the satellite is uh, described by this true anomaly. Uh, basically, from the uh, altitude and the inclination, we can uh, accurately predict the uh, satellite's uh, uh, 3D uh, position. So this is kind of a real orbit. The red one is a, uh, the, the, uh, we call the polar orbit, which has an inclination 90 degree. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, orbit is not used because we can see that uh, it has the highest coverage at the polar area, which is, uh, doesn't have population. So in the real deployment, they always have inclined the orbit plan. Uh, the uh, green one and this uh, blue one. Uh, this is some uh, basic math about the uh, satellite orbit, and from uh, orbit we can calculate, estimate the coverage. This is coverage, and the, also we can uh, estimate the speed. So basically, the uh, only known parameter right now for the uh, orbit is uh, altitude. And uh, uh, from the Starlink uh, uh, practice, uh, they give the uh, this uh, called the beta angle, which is elevation angle. Uh, means that this is a, a 
when the angle less than this, the satellite uh, is invisible and the communication is not possible. So from this, we can calculate this uh, angle length. Then from this uh, similar as uh, cellular communication, we can easily calculate how, how many satellites needed to cover the whole uh, Earth. And also, uh, we can estimate the maximum uh, communication time uh, for uh, any uh, ground station. For example, if uh, a satellite is moving from here to here, then the whole, uh, 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 no, from here to here, the, the means that the, the, the diameter is the longest path the satellite can move uh, for one ground station. That distance can be used as an estimation for uh, how, how long time the communication can be lost. So this is some data we uh, have uh, uh, calculated. Uh, this is the uh, altitude of satellites, VLU, LU, and uh, uh, different altitudes. Uh, for LU, normally the uh, altitude will be uh, below 1,500 kilometers. And the VLU will be below 500 kilometers. From the practice uh, of uh, Starlink, it seems like right now the, the current technology still cannot work very well for LU. means that the distance or altitude too high. Right now, the uh, Starlink has moved a lot of satellites before uh, plan to uh, launch at LU to VLU. So this is the uh, alpha angle we calculated. And from that, we can calculate the, the uh, radio uh, of the coverage. We can see the radio uh, of coverage is from a couple of hundred kilometers to uh, over uh, a thousand kilometers. And this is the minimum number required to cover the whole uh, Earth. But this estimation is using inclination angle 90 degree. If the angle is uh, less than that, the estimation will be similar, but it's not uh, important because right now the real deployment will have much more density than this uh, requirement. So here we can estimate the communication time, maximum communication time. And uh, this is uh, uh, for the uh, uh, different uh, altitude of satellites, we can see maximum communication time uh, for VLU, uh, for example, this is only 300 uh, kilometers, only about 100 seconds. Even for LU, only about 400 seconds, which is less than five minutes. Remember, this is maximum communication time. So normally the communication time will be less than this. Here we also estimate for the uh, inter-satellite communication how long time the, the communication can last. So for example, we have a different uh, uh, intersection angle. If the zero means that the satellite moving uh, with the same direction for different altitude of the satellite. And we can see even with the same angle, if the, 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 the uh, with the same direction, uh, if the, uh, 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 speed are different uh, in the draft. We have more uh, data here. This, this table is not complete. We can see how uh, a long time the communication can last. For example, this one will be less than uh, probably 20 hours. So for intersatellite communication. Uh, next, we will talk about the uh, uh, satellite networking. This is not about the issue of uh, individual satellites. This is about the satellite constellation, so the issue will be much more complicated. And first, we, we can uh, figure out what is the possible operation model. Right now, the, we can uh, easily think about two models. One is called a satellite relay. Satellite relay means that a signal uh, will be bounced between satellite and the ground station, either by one satellite or by multiple satellites. The second one will be uh, a uh, uh, single will go through the inter-satellite link between satellites. But uh, this technology is still not mature. And the Starlink has started to uh, uh, experiment some, but definitely it's not used. Right now, as we can predict, only this logic is used. So even this multi-satellite ground station really is not used because that's not a simple issue. I will show that. And uh, from the uh, estimation, we can see the satellite to ground station communication is very dynamic. The maximum time of communication can only last probably less than five minutes. And if we bring the, in the inter-satellite communication to the picture, 
then the uh, communication between satellite will be also not very steady, not like a uh, current service provider network. It will keep changing every day, for example. So from this, we can see that uh, satellite consternation network will be very dynamic in terms of topology, and also it will uh, lead to the very frequent handover. So common issues, first is uh, mobility. Uh, for example, right now we have uh, already had many uh, mobility technologies there, but the current mobility technology may not be helpful for this uh, spatial scenario. For example, right now all mobility technology is based on the assumption that mobile and communication, mobile and the communication nodes plus the static base station and provider network. So, for example, uh, the um, uh, 3GPP wireless. The cell phone is moving, base station is not moving, mobile call is no, not moving, service provider network is also not moving. So we have an inter or intra hands over there. The, the, the scheme is relatively easy because the uh, mobility is very limited in very limited the devices. And also ITF uh, introduced the uh, mobile IP, mobile V6, proxy uh, mobile IPv6 and all this. And uh, uh, in the recent presentation, I saw the uh, ATN also come to picture, but it's uh, uh, still based on all these existing technologies, even if it is used for the airplane. And the satellite mobility is uh, different. We will have a uh, end communication node static. For example, if you use the uh, uh, satellite for uh, home access, your, your uh, ground station is static, but the provider network is moving. Right now, if you're using the satellite as a provider network, it will be keep moving. And also the moving speed is fast, as I, I showed that the communication time is very short. Uh, second uh, uh, things we have to consider is that in satellite, the power uh, supply is very constrained. Uh, be because of this, then uh, packet loss forwarding should consider the, this uh, limitation. Also, the link speed is limited. For example, uh, in, from the current research, even we use a uh, uh, laser for inter-satellite link, uh, probably the link speed is uh, still below the 10 gig from the current technology. Uh, here, uh, I will show some uh, 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 issues for the different operation model. And uh, I don't list uh, all the de uh, requirements and the problems because some other problem I think we have solution. And uh, uh, it is listed in the draft because draft has uh, over 30 pages. I don't want to list uh, some uh, uh, less important issue here. I just want to show the, uh, what is the critical one. For example, if we only use one satellite to do the communication, it will be the same situation as we use the GSO currently, for example, uh, uh, geosynchronous uh, uh, orbit satellites. It's just uh, uh, physically reflecting the uh, 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 signal uh, between ground station and the satellite. It will be easier. But if we have multiple uh, uh, satellite really come to picture, it is not that simple. Why? Because the, uh, the, the real satellite constellation will have a lot of uh, ground stations. So, for example, from Starlink uh, uh, request from FCC, right? They request over one million ground station. One million ground station in which they have uh, three types. One is the end for end user. Second is that the ground station can connect to internet. Third one is a uh, ground station is a uh, is a uh, called gateway ground station. These two called gateway ground station, but some gateway ground stations not connect to internet. And uh, from current data, uh, in the United States, there are about already about more than 100 ground stations there. So with so many ground stations and the uh, number of satellites, um, uh, the, the things will become uh, uh, complicated. For example, even between two uh, ground stations, right, they may have multiple uh, satellites come above and uh, all uh, satellites can provide a service, then which one will you will choose? It's not a simple issue. Second is that, uh, what is the ground station you will choose to reflect your signal? For example, you have multiple satellites, you have multiple 
pronunciation, and which one you will be peer for your uh, whole pass. For example, this is a, a final, we, we can reflect a single between a, a multiple ground station and a satellite to reach one ground station, which is connected to internet. Then which pass we will choose? You, you may have a different passes. So this is just three uh, typical issues involved in the multiple satellite relay. And of course, for all this, we have to think about the, the uh, uh, how to solve it in terms of the protocol or technology. Uh, Lin, if you don't mind us being up, uh, you're running a bit late. Okay, so uh, 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 next is about inter-satellite communication uh, used for satellite uh, uh, networking. This is the most complicated. And it will be comp comp uh, compilation of uh, SL link and the satellite ground station link. Ground station could be isolated or interconnected. Right now, the technology is not mature. And the two key issues, one is the inter-satellite communication. This is not the direct concern. We only concern about the routing and the switch. Here is the issues. All satellite constellation is moving. And according to traditional technology, we should use IGP, for example, EBGP between the internet and the ground station, then also EBGP between the local uh, internet and this. Then if there are so many ground stations and so many network, and if the topologies keep moving, definitely the current technology cannot handle it. For example, we will have massive IGP flooding, and the BGP convergence will, come to, uh, it will be become a serious issue there. Yeah, that's uh, my presentation. Uh, just uh, want to have more comments and feedback. Thank you very much. So uh, let me jump uh, here in the queue. Uh, I'm curious about whether you are proposing to solve this at layer three, because the, the problem has existed for a while uh, since the light, late uh, 90s when the teledisic network was first uh, planned. Uh, they were already solving it at layer two with inter-satellite links. Um, and then the internet was running on, on top of that. So is your proposal? Yeah, as I, yeah, I, as I said, right now, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, historic work is uh, only uh, focusing in the, either physical layer or just using the uh, individual or very few satellites to do the communication. But right now, if the satellite become a number become big and the ground station number become big, the issue will be different. No networking issue was involved before. Right now, the uh, uh, definitely networking issues involved. For example, the Starlink has start, uh, think, think about it, uh, deploy uh, a provider service in the ocean. When uh, in the ocean, then there's no ground station can connect to internet. They have to use multiple ground stations. Then how to uh, do it in net from the networking uh, manner is a challenge. We don't have solution right now. We just want to draw attention uh, for this uh, typical issue. We just have some thought, but it's very preliminary. And uh, we, I think we, they may have a different uh, uh, technology involved than uh, 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 maybe more uh, uh, solution will come to, uh, come to the uh, community. All right. Well, thanks. Then we'll, we'll continue on the on the list while well, we have Eric uh, on the line, and then we can move on to Dirk. Eric. Um, yeah, I just was going to repeat a comment I made in the in the chat. I think that because the satellites are uh, their motion is highly predictable, you don't need a routing protocol to like deal with a bunch of dynamic updates, except in the case of uh, intersatellite link failures. Uh, if you have an SDN that can just basically issue routing updates to be enacted at various times in the future. All right, so uh, let's see if I still can handle, because right now the even uh, uh, the time is predictable, but uh, due to weather, due to the uh, uh, blocking objects, due to multiple uh, satellites, the, uh, the work is not that simple. Okay. OK, thank you very much for that. So we have to move on to the next presenter, uh, Dirk. Yes, um, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to present the um, next uh, two drafts. Um, I know they are listed as two separate um, items, but we combined them because the work um, is kind of like building on uh, onto each other. So this is about the 
uh, internet addressing problem statement and the gap analysis. We presented the problem statement initially in the last ITF uh, and uh, as presented there the, the plan to continue with the gap analysis, which we have done since. So I'm going to provide an update on the problem statement and then go into the gap analysis. Um, yeah, there is. So, so I mean, Tool has provided quite a bit of the background um, where, where we're also building on. Um, internet addressing is the core method that allows me to direct packets in the global internet. Um, uh, but, but as similar to Tool's observation, we, we can say that a lot of the overall communication system actually, um, you know, lies in limited domains, uh, as, as, as described in RC8799. Uh, and those limited domains uh, uh, define requirements, node behaviors, address semantics, packet forwarding that may be significantly different from the internet addressing paradigm while still potentially interconnecting um, or connecting to the, the internet or interconnecting over the internet. Um, that very often requires that there are additional adaptation technologies involved that realize the distinguishing requirements of these scenarios. So that's the, the background and the observation from which we started um, the, the work in the in the problem statement draft so the objective of both drafts is really you know revol revolving around the question of whether uh, you know limited domain should purely rely on ip addresses and therefore deal with the complexity to translate any semantic mismatch that arises from addressing the domain specific requirements themselves or should there be some flexibility for supporting those limited domains um, you know and should there be a key focus for an involved internet addressing that's the kind of key, key question that we ask in the problem statement draft for that we formulated the problem statement draft by providing examples for communication scenarios where the existing internet addressing structure may be a potential hindrance and then provide a first gap analysis. Uh, so we've done this already in the last idea and updated this since and we then provided uh, a first gap analysis um, in which we provide an overview over the many recognized extensions to the core internet addressing properties as we can find them. So generally, our intention for these two drafts is to stimulate discussion on the emerging needs for addressing, um, really to, you know, to, to get to a point where we would want to fundamentally rethink the addressing in the internet beyond what, what IP mistakes and the current objective give us at the moment. We do recognize there are a number of proposals that fix aspects or claim to fix aspects. Um, we're not, the drafts are not about promoting one over the other. Um, this is really about, you know, the need to identify, uh, to, sorry, to recognize the need, work towards an architectural approach and think about extensibility and evolution of internet addressing uh, in, you know, to start with. So what are the updates uh, on the problem statement? Of, as I mentioned, we, we, we provided a first draft in the last ITF. We since then added um, two new co-authors um, to, uh, to the problem statement draft, we provided input into uh, um, a number of communication scenarios, uh, Yamala from Rochester Institute and, and uh, Paolo from Airbus. We uh, simplified the, uh, the, the structure of the problem statement draft in the light of the gap analysis. Um, we moved a lot of the, in particular, section three was uh, significantly uh, updated. First, we updated the scenarios um, based on the input that were provided by our new co-authors, as I mentioned before. And then the, um, the issues were simplified in the light of the separate gap analysis. So, so the, the section is actually significantly shorter now as it used to be before, and some of the things were then moved into the gap analysis draft. Um, even though we added fragility and extensibility as additional concerns that were previously not um, listed as issues in addressing them. And then again, um, uh, uh, finishing with the actual problem statement. So these are the updates on that draft. The, for the... Um, Gap analysis draft. So the main flow of the document, if you read, if you had a chance to read the, the document, which I hope you did, uh, is to focus on three key properties for internet addressing. The first thing, thing is the fixed address length, 232, 120, uh, 128 bits, the ambiguous address semantic with explicit locator and implicit identifier, and the limited address semantic support with, with mainly prefix based um, semantics as they are supported. We then outline extensions to those key properties. That's where we, 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 we place uh, um, essentially the, the research work we've done to, 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 to survey the number of, and I'll come to this in a separate slide, 
number of extensions that have been uh, that have been defined, and we position them as attempts to fill identified gaps in properties through these point solutions as we identify them, to overcome those identified gaps. Gaps. So the so the the the, the logic is um, that these extensions have been developed to address something that that those who develop the extensions have um, have have perceived as a gap in internet addressing. We then identify issues with those extensions, which may be solved with an involved addressing or not. That's, that, that's of course, part of the discussion, uh, and, and list those issues separately. And this, you can find, the first part you can find in section two of the draft, um, the second part, the extension in section three, and the issues in section five. Section four is an, is, is an overview table. Um, which you can see here. So in, in overall, we identified 20 plus extensions um, that we described and referenced, and we're very happy to receive pointers to more approaches. So this is obviously a first run. This is a first um, version of the gap analysis. So you may appreciate that we have overlooked um, a number of extensions, um, obviously, but we've taken that initial list already um, as a uh, as a as a as an evidence of shortcomings to internet addressing properties, um, as as a, you know, in in the way of these extensions having, um, uh, you know, having addressed particular aspects that the the, the developers or authors. We also included some research work, uh, and and uh, as well as existing standards. So there's a mix, uh, a healthy mix of of, of aspects. On extensions that are described uh, in in that section, uh, and we took this as as evidence that those do, you know that develop those extensions have you know seen shortcomings of the internet addressing as a reason for developing them. So then that's we we as a summary of the issues we identified uh, in, in 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 red here, and the table is also in in the draft, are issues that lead to limiting the address semantics because of you know certain ways with which the extensions were fitted into, for instance, IPv6 uh, and, and, and needed to deal with the limitation that were given through that. Um, issues around complexity and efficiency, uh, issues around security and fragility. Complexity and efficiency includes aspects like repetitive encapsulation, compounding issues with header compression, introducing path stretch or, or making traffic engineering more complicated. And, and, and then we assigned, as you can see in the table, obviously in more words, um, this is just the summary table, um, what the various issues are and, and which of the approaches experienced or uh, those particular issues. So these identified extensions provide an evidence that, are, that there are gaps remaining, if you will, um, because the, 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 the issues or some of the issues either still existed or other issues were simply introduced um, through the solution. So what are the insights that we have so far from the problem statement and the gap analysis? Well, first, there, in the gap analysis, we identified many scenarios in which existing internet addressing shows shortcomings in realizing them. Um, and, and that you can find in the problem statement section two. We also um, have identified that the internet community has recognized that shortcomings do exist to the original properties. And, and thus developed point extensions with the attempt to fix them, right? So we are not the only one that recognize shortcomings. Um, the internet community overall has recognized that. It's been working around those shortcomings for a very, very long time. We also identified that there are a number of compounding issues with those extensions um, that, that particularly increase the fragility when you consider point extensions and coexistence. We have a separate, um, subsection in the GAP analysis draft that, that addresses that particular aspect. And, and, and while we, 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 we may see the idea of doing point extension to addressing here, and if I have an issue, I just do my own extension um, over possibly any existing or even a new header field as the powerful tool for extending the internet itself. What we have described in the draft is that by doing so, um, you know, you, you, you start creating a whole tale of further issues that may just, you know, roll off that point extension. And it, it, it most importantly, it may increase the complexity as well as the fragility of the overall system. So yes, it may be a very, very powerful tool, but it's not one um, that comes without problems on its own. So what's the expectation that we have for our work going forward? 
Well, as I said, mentioned before, um, we want to promote uh, the discussion to develop an architectural, but more importantly, a sustainable approach to make internet addressing extensible so that we can capture the many new use cases um, that we may identify. And, and looking back at the a very first presentation from Shatura, um, you know, question that could be asked in, 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 in his particular area that he presented, um, whether or not there were there would be any addressing issues that may, one may identify for these particular type of use case, new use cases he had in mind. Um, I think I asked a similar question on the mailing list when he um, sent the draft around. We also believe that any inaction on our side will only compound the issues we identified. It doesn't make it better, they won't go away. And we feel that eventually it will hamper the future internet's readiness to address those and then support those new use cases. And not only uh, the one that we mentioned, um, there are many others that also Torlis um, uh, uh, um, pointed out in his presentation with the iceberg quite nicely. So what are the next steps that we have in mind? Well, for the broadband uh, draft, we, we would like to expand on possibly missing communication scenarios, um, the same way we've done this um, after a 110, um, to reach out to potential contributors to um, either extend or add communication scenarios that we may have missed. Um, we're very interested in that, obviously. Um, for the gap analysis, um, the, the, the extension we've identified are only um, the beginning, even though they're 20 plus um, at missing extension internet addressing. In order to elaborate on the issues through more evidence and evidence uh, and references that we can find, right? the more extension we find, the more we believe we find evidence that they, in particular they, they are compounding issues um, with, with developing those extensions. For that, we seek new co authors and contributors um, even, you know, would like to identify the right partners organization to work with, um, you know, maybe even in the form of a liaison, um, uh, like like the one being proposed um, by, by ISO IEC, for instance, um, on, on um, underwater networks, as an example that, that came to our attention, um, that one could use to maybe work with other organizations, in particular those that are, that are bringing these new requirements into uh, or towards the ITF. Goal ultimately for us is the adoption of the documents for future work in the end area, to go f uh, to extend the gap analysis, to move uh, to a discussion on requirements and as to w w uh, what the requirements of future solution may be um, before we start um, looking into potential approaches to solve these issues. The questions we have to the community is whether or not the Extensions have shown that gaps to addressing have uh, you know have been identified. Um, is, is, you know, is the logic we apply um, the right one? Are they identified uh, issues worth thinking of different approaches, or are we just you know fine with doing those? Do we think we can avoid the issues, or you know just uncover others? Um, does the community believe that or agree that an architectural approach is required that make extensibility of addressing a key principle? to future addressing, or can we just continue doing what we've done so far um, with all the issues that we found in the gap analysis and may find in future extensions? And obviously, um, the, the, the question for us going forward, um, contributors to the discussion, uh, want to work with us, uh, push the discussion and the material further um, through, through extending the drafts and working in future drafts. Thanks. That's it from my side. Questions and comments I would appreciate. Thanks a lot, Dirk. Um, so are there any questions from the community? OK, well, if we don't have any questions right now, I think that uh, it's a topic that I invite you to bring to the, to the list. Uh, especially if you are seeking to to get some um, uh, work in this area, in this area, we need to see some some support reviews and so on uh, from the from the group. So I encourage you to bring the discussion to the mailing list. Yes, thanks. Absolutely, we'll do that. Thank you very much. So moving on, uh, we have uh, Kieran. OK, 
okay, we can see it now. You want to turn on your mic? We can see the slides, but we cannot hear you. So I don't know if you hear me, but uh, you need to click on the mic uh, icon that is on the top left side of your screen. I, I, I didn't realize I was on mute. OK, um, now we can hear you. Yeah, so sorry about that. My name is Kiran. And this draft was first presented in IoT Ops Group on Monday. So what we are trying to do here is um, bring in the scenarios and some of the challenges which are related to industry control networks. Since in ITF, we have talked a lot about constrained devices or IoT in general. We haven't really focused on uh, uh, industry control networks and the lower level field bus type of devices. And with Industry 4.0 in initiative, automation and smart manufacturing, um, bringing in IT technologies and OT, technolo OT has become a lot more interesting uh, topic of discussion. So um, since we discussed most of the stuff there, I just want to introduce uh, this topic a little bit. And uh, we'll just introduce a little bit of uh, industry control networks, some of the scenarios and challenges we are looking at, and what are the possible functional areas that could uh, possibly overlap between int area and IoT ops work. So this is the general picture which even Torles uh, talked about earlier that uh, industry control networks are built in a tiered fashion. You start from the device as a lower level and then you keep stitching the different kinds of protocols together till you get to some system integration layer. And that's where from that point onwards, you will have some kind of manual or uh, proprietary custom integration between your business logic applications that feed the that collect the information from the industry control networks but with automation you need to have a much better integration between uh, these two different types of networks which up until now have just evolved independently and uh, if you look in deeper into what are the different properties of uh, devices in the process control First of all, they are wired devices. They are not wireless devices, so they do not have specific requirements for saving on energy or how you can use them or things which we have already discussed in the uh, IoT 6 low pan and those type of te um, uh, technologies and protocols. But um, these are uh, the critical factors are that they have uh, direct process control loops uh, the process in the sense that you have to have uh, time constrained networks and since that work is already done in that net we were not really focused on that part but the communication patterns security and the location how the devices move on the factory floors all these things are very well planned so you have some sort of deterministic view of your network that how it is going to behave and because of that, operators of those networks, they very uh, carefully engineer and design their network in the sense that they are stingy about what kind of network resources or how much of network resources they are deploying on those factory flows because their focus is on the operations part first. And the communication patterns are very different. You don't have a large package sizes up until now. You, it is mostly a command-based system. You will have a register in the command and a register where just you want to send a two-byte or a one-byte command for a machine to move in a specific direction or with a specific pressure applied onto it. But with automation, these things are changing. So with uh, when we talk, start talking about ITOT convergence, uh, the decision to move IT servers on factory floors will become one of the biggest questions. So right now, your factory floors 
are very focused on um, OT related uh, technology operations technology and uh, 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 when you start talking about industry protocols IP uh, and if you want to take IP all the way down to the devices it is going to be an overhead another scenario which is evolving is um, virtualization in this case uh, right now so far we have uh, physical PLCs on the factory floors but uh, with virtualization they are talking about virtual PLCs and that brings a question that where would you log where would want to place that software will that be on the factory floor or on the edge or somewhere in the cloud and very much related to that is sophisticated compute platform do you want to really uh, make your factory flow network complex enough and you want to bring all those compute intensive servers which run on IT uh, platforms in on the factory floor or would you want to place them somewhere in the edge or cloud or how would you want to extend them there are also implications on data growth and the reason for that is uh, so right now everything was like a push you want to put a command you want to send a command down to a specific machine on the factory floor but now in order to collect a lot of telemetry additional sensors are being installed and those sensors will continuously send the data up to wherever you have uh, some kind of uh, statistics or telemetry, uh, telemetry control system and you want to feed that into your business logic to see how your inventory is doing when do you want to start the process or when do you want to finish the process what will be a good time to start a particular manufacturing cycle so in order to make all those decisions you need to collect a lot of sensory data and that will cause the data growth and uh, the fourth aspect which normally people generally do not discuss is that even on the factory floor there are different kinds of infrastructure interplaying with each other you could have a building automation system where you want to control air conditioning cooling and lighting of the plant and you could also have some kind of security system into the detection that who's coming in or out of the factory you would also have additional cameras installed just for the quality control and inspection. All these are uh, different applications, specific networks serving different kind of purposes. And from the automation perspective, to have a single view of your system, you would want to integrate those things together. And we want to study how ITF-based protocols or IT technologies can play a part there. And uh, uh, from, the, from, from a high level, we looked at two key challenges. One is the heterogeneity. We talked about that there are different infrastructures on the same factory floor. And uh, actually, there are around 100 different protocols, field bus related. They are mod bus, profibus, uh, building automation, and whatnot. And within them, there are different variations based on vendors or some small group of uh, companies standardizing a particular protocol just among themselves and then there are a lot of what that means is to in order to absorb that heterogeneity there are uh, multiple stateful gateways install uh, are required on the factory floor you're always translating from one protocol to the other protocol which is not really an efficient and scalable way, especially when you when you start adding a lot of sensors and more number of devices. There is uh, also, have, uh, sorry, you have one minute left. Uh, OK, so yeah. automation, I already talked about that. How do you go from device to all the way to the cloud? What are the mechanisms that we need to install in order to make that happen? And when we were looking at these things, obviously addressing came as uh, one of the key differentiator. If you look at the figures on the right hand side, IP addresses are pretty much fixed in terms of the stack or the kind of stack network stack we talk about. Whereas in industry protocols, you have and different kinds of uh, uh, protocols sitting on top. And it's most of the times it is just an application uh, PDU, which is riding on the physical interface or the layer two. 
And how could we simplify these things? Uh, on the left hand side is the current state of work where you have stayed in the industry where you have different protocols, uh, stacks. And what we think is that if we had some kind of asymmetric addressing mechanism where you were, your address formats for the source and destination were different, but you could still do a communication between them, that will really simplify your uh, network architecture on a factory floor. And uh, so these are the potential work areas. Uh, you could look at it from the device perspective in the industry on the factory floor, from the network layer perspective, and some additional stuff on the network that how can you make encapsulation free communication between devices and the cloud. Uh, so we'll continue to have these discussions in the IoT ops and come up with a very comprehensive document on um, scenarios and the requirements. and possibly go deeper into the addressing aspects of it. So we just wanted to share this with Int Area Group and see if there is any interest here. And if you would like to have discussions on Int Area Group, I'll definitely bring this work there. And thank you. Thanks, Kiran. Are there any questions right now for Kiran? All right, seeing none, um, if anyone has any other comment, please bring it up to the to the list and provide your feedback there. Moving on, we have uh, Fred. Right. Yes, so we're granting you access now to share. We can see it now. OK, very good. Yes, my name is Fred Temple, and I'm with Boeing. I want to talk about transmission of IP packets over overlay multi-link network interfaces, or Omni interfaces. So what uh, the transmission of IP packets over Omni interfaces is, is it's about a single non-broadcast multiple access network interface that gets exposed to the IP layer and it presents a 9KB MTU to the IP layer. But underneath, it's configured as an overlay over multiple underlying physical or virtual interfaces that may have heterogeneous MTUs. Within the Omni interface is a service known as the Omni Adaptation Layer or the OAL. And it's a minimum mid-layer encapsulation that maps the IP layer to the underlying interfaces. It's very similar to AAL5 uh, from the old ATM days. Uh, the work is very closely related to draft template six-man Aero, and Aero and Omni were formally discussed in the six-man working group but not adopted there, and so now we're seeking adoption in the routing working group for Aero and the interior working group for, for Omni. Um, the work is also very closely related to, but separate from a, a draft that was an int area called int area tunnels that uh, apparently has been expired uh, for, for the past several months. So uh, talking about um, Aero and Omni in a single inner network example, we have client nodes that connect to access network subnetworks via one or more data links. Those subnetworks then connect to the inner network via proxy servers as subnetwork edge nodes. And those proxy servers act as IPv6 routers or IPv6 neighbor discovery proper proxies. Uh, bridges within the, within the, in the inner network establish a spanning tree over the inner network using IPv6 unique local addresses, ULAs. And the Omni adaptation layer in all nodes that configure Omni interfaces use IPv6 encapsulation and see this spanning tree as a layer two service, the same as if it was a bridge campus LAN. So then we can go from the single internetwork case to look at the bigger picture where we have arbitrarily many internetwork segments joined as NBMA link. Segment routing over the concatenated internetworks using OAL forwarding. Um, some examples of internetworking segments would include the IPv4 internet, the IPv6 internet, uh, corporate enterprise networks, cellular operator networks, aeronautical tel uh, telecommunication service provider networks. And 
one thing to note is that the clients may also connect to multiple distinct segments at the same time. It's not shown in this diagram to reduce complexity, but in the big picture, we can have arbitrarily many segments, internetworking segments connected together into a single NBMA link using encapsulation at the OAL layer. So what this Omni interface looks like is that the Arrow and Omni clients, proxy servers, and bridges configure Omni interfaces as the node's connection to the Omni link. Client over Omni interfaces are configured over multiple underlying interfaces and they connect end user networks to the Omni link. So if you see the diagram in the upper left, you have the IP layer in the end system configured over an Omni interface. Within the Omni interface, the Omni adaptation layer maps the uh, IP layer to the underlying interfaces that are shown here as L2, IF1, IF2, and IF, IFN, and so forth. Um, the Omni interface uses IPv6 encapsulation to span the entire concatenated internetworking path in a single NBMA layer, layer three hop. And all Arrow and Omni nodes are seen as neighbors on the link as is shown in the right-hand diagram. So the Omni link is an overlay over arbitrarily many internetworks with all nodes on the Omni link that configure Omni interfaces, that is, seen as neighbors on the link. So Omni client underlying interfaces can be con coordinated with their proxy services in one of several ways. First, we have direct connect, otherwise known as point-to-point -point client underlying interfaces. And these connect directly to the proxy server at layer two over point-to-point -point media without traversing any layer three hops. Uh, then with VPNs, the client's underlying interface uses network layer security to establish a virtual link to the proxy server over one or more L3 hops at the layer below the VPN, that is. Access network interfaces are in which clients' underlying interfaces connect to a secured access network, uh, such as an enterprise or operator network, that have layer two or layer one security provisions on the path to, to the proxy server, which then connects out to the external internetwork. And then finally, internetwork interfaces are clients' underlying interfaces that connect directly to an external internet where the, the proxy server may be one or, one or more L3 hops away. And the clients may be located between behind one or several network address translators in the internet case. But the point is that clients may have diverse underlying interface types which connect to multiple distinct inner networks as opposed to all via the same internet network. For example, an I inter net interface connect to a public internet, an A net interface connected to a cellular operator network, a direct interface connected to a dedicated enterprise network proxy server, et cetera. They're all possible within the same Omni interface to have multiple different distinct types of underlying interface connections. So then what it looks like in terms of the stack is if you see the, the, the stack orientation on the left-hand side, you have the network layer, which is where original IP packets come from, are presented to the Omni interface. Within the Omni interface, we have many different encapsulation sublayer possibilities before the packets are then mapped to the outgoing underlying interfaces. So again, the Omni interface inserts a mid-layer encapsulation between layer three and the underlying interfaces using minimal encapsulation with effective header compression. Uh, mid-layer segment routing is used as necessary to tra traverse spanning trees over disjoint internetworking segments, and then route optimization is used to, to, to avoid strict spanning tree paths. So in terms of Arrow and Omni addressing, uh, some of the earlier talks were talking about uh, variable length addressing. We're, we're, we're looking strictly here at the standard IPv6 and IPv4 addressing architectures, not assuming any kind of variable length addressing. So we would say that each client would have an IP global unicast address prefix, whether it would be IPv4 or IPv6, that's also known as a mobile network prefix. And that gets advertised to downstream attached end user networks where we might have Internet of Things devices, for example. So an example prefix would be 2001 db812 colon colon slash 64. And again, end user network applications use mobile network prefix addresses as the source and destination addresses of original IP packets. Um, each Aero Omni node configures an IPv6 link local address. That's for use in IPv6 neighbor discovery messaging. Uh, clients configure mobile network prefix link local addresses. So for example, for the delegated prefix 2001 db812 colon colon slash 64, the mobile network prefix link local address is 
FE80 link local, followed by the interface identifier 2001 DB812. That's what's known as the arrow address construction from that mobile network prefix. Now, meanwhile, proxy servers and bridges, which are fixed infrastructure elements, configure administrative link local addresses with the least significant 32 bits set according to the segment routing topology node number in your subnetwork. So, for example, if the segment routing technology sub, sub, subnet was 2001 colon 1000, then the administrative link local addresses within that, within that subnet are assigned as FE80 colon colon 2001 1001, 1002, 1003, and so forth. They're administratively assigned addresses assigned to fixed infrastructure elements. Now, each arrow and Omni node also configures an IPv6 unique local address, which is formed by simply taking the ULA prefix for the Omni link. For example, FD00 colon 01020304056, and taking this, the interface identifier suffix from the link local address and putting that into the interface identifier of the unique local, local address, as you can see in this lawn address here below. Clients, proxy servers, and bridges use ULAs as the OAL header source and destination addresses when IPv6 encapsulation is used by the OAL. Um, I think I'll skip this part talking about any cast addresses because it's not really relevant to the Omni discussion. And the also the Arrow and Omni routing system, what's being shown here is the spanning tree I referred to earlier in the green segments that span the connect, interconnected internetworking segments. Um, this is, there's a secured spanning tree in which the spanning tree is configured over IPsec, WireGuard, et cetera, at layer two, and the unsecured spanning tree, which over, travels over the same hop, but there are no secure, L2 security provisions provided. Control messages cover uh, always travel over the secured spanning tree. Data messages tra uh, travel over the unsecured spanning tree. So that any kind of routing that gets established is through secured neighbor discovery messages that are carried over the secured spanning tree. Now, really where I want to focus in on this talk for today's session with the int area is what this Omni interface does and what the Omni adaptation layer does. So we have an original source that sends an original IP packet that travels through some edge internetwork until it reaches a node that attaches to the Omni link which is shown in this, this uh, uh, lavender colored cylinder. And that node is known as the OAL source. The OAL, OAL source has an Omni interface as, as shown in, in the stack, um, um, stack diagram here. And it, 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 it performs what's known as OAL encapsulation, um, which in, in, inserts an IPv6 encapsulation header and a, uh, uh, a, a trailer, uh, um, tra trailer checksum. Um, the, after, after the uh, encapsulations are included, the, the uh, um, OAL then fragments the packet if necessary to create carrier packets that are guaranteed small enough to traverse all paths. So the Omni interface has a 9180 by MTU. Within the Omni interface, the OAL fragments the packet if necessary to make sure that all of the carrier packet fragments will traverse any concatenated paths, networks in the path without loss due to size restriction. So what we know is that for IPv4, the minimum maximum receive unit is 576 bytes. So what that says is without any further knowledge, we can always assume that carrier packets less than 576 bytes will, will travel any internet we can pass without loss due to size restriction. So that's what we know without any advanced information. But if we know um, that, that the path can carry a larger, then we can fragment to a larger size for example, 1,500 bytes. So the original source then can tune the packet sizes to achieve optimal performance based on hard or soft MTU feedback that comes back from the network without loss. And this provides for a lossless path MTU discovery service between the OAL source and the OAL destination. And then the original packet is finally delivered to the final destination on the edge networks at, that are beyond the OAL destination. So what happens when we have concatenated inner networks is that we have the OAL source and OAL destination are, are joined through OAL intermediate nodes that traverse those uh, intermediates uh, um, inter networking regions. 
So again, the OAL source and final destination are in different internetwork segments. The OAL source pr produces carrier packets and the OAL destination reassembles them. And the OAL intermediate nodes, which are also known as bridges, join the network segments in a spanning tree. And we have support for global mobility and route optimization with dynamic MTU tu tuning. And again, this is a lossless path MTU discovery with a MT an assured MTU of 9180 bytes. Now we use on the Omni interface, IPv6 neighbor discovery messaging for neighbor coordination and for establishing uh, uh, layer two routing information across the, the, uh, the concatenated inner networks. Um, the IPv6 neighbor discovery messages include an Omni option. And the purpose of the Omni option is to assert protocol conformance, to synchronize windows between Omni peers and to exchange configuration information. So on the right, you see what this Omni option looks like. This is a new IPv6 neighbor discovery uh, option type. The type field has the new, the new type that we'll be getting from IANA. The length is obviously from TLV format. And then we have information including the sequence number, acknowledgement number, and window size for synchronizing identification sequence numbers between the Omni source and the OAL destination. And then the sub options contain, contain the configuration information to be passed. So the Omni option sub options include um, um, fields that determine the protocol operations. There are multi-link forwarding parameters, interface attributes, traffic selectors that determine addresses and other parameters for specific underlying interfaces. Uh, we have DHCP, HIP, uh, PIM sparse mode messages that combine the functions uh, with the IPv6 neighbor discovery as, as a wrapper. Uh, and then we have reassembly limit fragmentation, report ICMP error, et cetera, to provide Omni destination feedback to the source. So these are the sub options that can occur within the Omni option. Now, when a client comes onto the network and locates proxy servers, it performs router solicitation advertisement messages either directly to the proxy server or using the proxy server as a proxy middle box. So when a client sends an RS message to a proxy server A with all routers multicast or the administrative link local address of A as the destination, A assumes the router role and returns an immediate unicast RA while injecting the client's mobile network prefix into the routing system. When a client sends an RS message to proxy server B with the administrative link local address of A as the destination, the, but B instead assumes the proxy role and forwards the RS message to A, which returns a unicast RA to client B via, as, as, via client B as a proxy. So then proxy server A becomes the hub, also known as the default router or mobility anchor point in a hub and spokes arrangement with all other proxy servers B star as the spokes. And the client can later switch to a different hub by sending new RS messages. So what that looks like in terms of the figure, here we have the client has sent a first RS message to the proxy server that you sh see shown in green. And that becomes the default router or the hub proxy server. Other proxy servers for the other underlying interfaces of that client are shown in red are treated as proxies and they forward the RS and RA, mess RA messages between the proxy server and the client as, pro as, as, as spokes and a hub and spokes arrangement. So now in terms of the MTU hardened software as I was referring to, RFCs 1191 and 8201 provide ICMP packet to big error messages that always report packet loss due to a size restriction or a hard error. Whenever one of these packet to big messages comes back, it's always because a packet was dropped because of a size restriction. But what Omni is asking for is a new packet to big uh, code to indicate a soft error. In this case, the packet is still delivered, but the error informs the source that it should reduce the size of the packets that it sends in future packets because for some reason, the network has experienced a level of discomfort for pass, passing packets larger than this size. So with these packet to big soft errors, sources can dynamically tune the sizes of the packets they send to get the perform best performance without loss related retransmissions on a per flow basis. It could be that some flows will have a better packet size of say 4K bytes, other flows might prefer a packet size of 1500 bytes, still others might prefer a packet size of 9180 bytes and they can all be dynamically tuned through soft errors instead of packet to big hard errors. 
Um, when the source and target client's underlying interfaces connect via an open net an internet where there's a very good chance they may be located behind one or more network address translators. Uh, each client naturally establishes NAT mappings when it performs an RSRA exchange with its first hop proxy server, but these mappings are generally not viable for client exchanges with other Aero Omni nodes besides that first hop proxy server. So that when an Aero Omni route optimization is applied, Route optimization peers must perform neighbor solicitation, neighbor advertisement uh, messages, and bubble exchanges to establish NAT mappings for itself in the NATs on the path to the target client. And these NAT traversal procedures are conducted in the same manner as for RFCs 4380 and 6081. So then for signaling other things that are going on in the OmniLink, IPv6 neighbor discovery message, unsolicited neighbor advertisement messages that are used. Hub proxy servers announce client state changes, such as mobility related address changes, link quality changes, traffic selector changes, and other, other factors by sending unsolicited neighbor advertisement messages to all nodes that has recently sent a neighbor advertisement for address resolution message to. So when the nodes that receive these unsolicited neighbor advertisements, they can update their state information for the client, which may require new NSNA NUD pass state exchanges. Um, new hub proxy servers send UNAs to inform an old proxy server that the client has departed and chosen a new hub proxy server. And when the old hub proxy server receives that message, it records the new hub proxy server address, withdraws the mobile network prefix route, and forwards unsolicited neighbor advertisements to nodes that has recently sent a neighbor advertisement to. Um, and then finally, target nodes request selective link layer transmit retransmissions by sending unsolicited neighbor advertisements to the source with identifications and orderable numbers of many fra missing fragments. When the source node receives these UNAs, it retransmits the requested fragments if it still has them in its retransmission cache. And the retransmission window should be brief, and that determines the link persistence. It's not true end-to-end -end reliability. It's, it's, it's opportunistic and best effort link persistence and link retransmissions. So finally, here we have a, a pointer to the draft. Mm -hmm. And we're wondering if this is something that could potentially be adopted as an IETF interior working group item. And I'll stop there since I'm out of time for any questions that there might be. Thanks, Brian. Indeed, uh, we are uh, at the end of the hour, but we might uh, drag for a couple of minutes if people have any questions right now. Otherwise. Uh, Please bring it to the list, but uh, well, we can take a couple of questions if people want to hear. Okay, seems like it's getting late for people right now, but uh, thanks a lot, detailed presentation. And uh, indeed, I think if, you, if you're looking to, to get uh, and ask for adoption, uh, we should uh, get a little more uh, support from the group. So please bring the, the discussion to the list uh, so that we can judge if this is something that the group would like to adopt. Yep. All right. So thanks, everyone. Uh, the presenters, uh, Wasim, Eric, uh, for attending. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, you had a, a fruitful and interesting uh, meeting. And we look forward to seeing you virtually or physically at the next uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Good night.